Hello everyone, welcome to the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew here in Brooklyn, New York. My name is the Reverend Andrew Durbich. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our service this morning of morning prayer on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Next Sunday, October the 4th, we start uh, or recommence our in-person services for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. We will have services at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. We hope that you'll be able to join us, but we understand if you, if you won't. We will continue to broadcast this service of morning prayer every Sunday for the foreseeable future. May God bless you this day and all the days that lie before you.
Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbour. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. A reading of a portion of Psalm 78. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will declare the mysteries of ancient times. That which we have heard and known, and what our forefathers have told us, we will not hide from their children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord and the wonderful works he has done. He worked marvels in the sight of their forefathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He split open the sea and let them pass through. He made the waters stand up like walls. He led them with a cloud by day and all the night through with a glow of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as was from the great deep. He brought streams out of the cliff and waters gushed out like rivers. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children? and livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people, and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Oreb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? 
the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has stormed upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will strengthen to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. The gates will always be open, by day or night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O king of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, 
We are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said to the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not challenge your minds and believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Over the past two weeks, the Gospel readings have revealed to us two parables which Jesus used to invite those that were listening to him and now us into a new life with him. Jesus invited them to move away from a life of individuality defined by putting our individual rights above the rights of others in our communities. He invited them, and now us, to move to a life of shared humanity, a life lived not just for ourselves, but for others as well. This is the life of grace that is promised in the two parables. This is the second half of life I mentioned last week, a concept Richard Rohr described in his book, Falling Upwards, the spirituality of the second half of life. We are raised in a world where debts are kept and not forgiven, and where justice is dispensed according to a measure of deserving. We have to step out of that mindset as Christians and into a new mindset, which aims toward living a good life with Jesus at the centre. The fracturing of our country at present and the political polarisation that is worsening every day has at its core a fight over the protection of individual rights. But whose rights are being protected and what constitutes these rights in is an open question. The wedge that is being driven ever so deeply into the core of our society forces us to choose sides. The outcome of either side seems to be I win and you lose. Concern only seems to be for one group and not for the whole. And if you are not with us, you are a loser. The rhetoric is powerful and threatening. Ever since humankind came forth on earth, we've been trying to work toward living a good life. As a species, this is inherent in our being, but we don't do this instinctively like other mammals. We need to discern what indeed constitutes a good life. There are innumerable sources and people willing to tell us, often for a fee, how to live a good life. Robin Lovin, author of The Christian Ethics, An Essential Guide, says of the good life, living a good life is always far more complex than either always choosing the things that advance our own interests or always putting other people first. What the good life requires of us probably cannot be reduced to a simple rule. But one thing is clear. Sometimes living a good life will mean giving up what is obviously and immediately good for us in order to do something that makes a good life possible for others. We are more able to make this shift when we move to the second half of life and live with a God at its centre. The second half of life is a life lived when we submit to the call of the Holy Spirit and follow Jesus Christ as our role model. God is at the centre and we are invited to act in the world by seeing it and engaging with it through the eyes and the heart of Christ. The grace and mercy that God gives us is then offered to others. As people of faith, we learn much about how to live the good life from participating in church through personal prayer and through the study of scripture, 
and also what constitutes Christian ethics. We learn from scripture the lessons from the Hebrew prophets who very much advanced God's desire for everyone to do what was right, which would lead to a good life. The prophet Micah writes, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The gospel writers also reveal to us the parables Jesus taught his disciples to help them move toward new lives, good lives. We read about the parable of the Good Samaritan and we hear of other stories of how Jesus acted towards different groups of people, especially the poor, the sick and the outcast. So the Christian life, like the good life, is in one sense entirely natural, says Robin Levin. The Christian life is not a choice against the life that other people obviously uh, seek for themselves. The Christian life is a search for the good life in a world created by God. God's creation sets natural limits on our lives and sets us in relationships with other people. And our good must be found within those uh, limitations and within those relationships. This process is continual. And as I mentioned earlier, we humans need to discern the right way to, do, to live a good life and not just to act on impulse. The good life for the Apostle Paul was fully bound up in his love of Jesus Christ and the early faith communities that he helped birth and nurture. His care of these communities meant that he often uh, sacrificed himself and his own needs for the greater good of the community. He often ended up in jail. And it is from jail that he wrote his letter to the church in Philippi. The tone of Paul's letter indicates uh, he was mentally and spiritually in a good place, as much as he could demonstrate from a damp and dirty jail cell. Pauline commentators write that this letter is one of the most cordial and affectionate we have from Paul's hand. The Philippi church in Macedonia was the first Christian church on mainland Europe, and they seem to have had a special place in Paul's heart. His letter, it is said, breathes his radiant joy and serene happiness in God. Paul writes in his letter, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Paul then recites what is thought to be an ancient hymn, one that reveals the true nature of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And it begins, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the same form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, the hymn says. This self-emptying is in theological terms called kenosis, the Greek for the act of emptying. The self-emptying that Jesus went through was the act of being emptied of the divine will so that he would, act, that he would be wholly receptive to God's will from his human life. This is an important concept for us to become familiar with. For Jesus to empty himself of his divine will meant that he could be fully human and over time learn to be filled with the Father's will. We also must go through this process as we move into the second half of life, the life lived with God at the center. Richard Rohr, who I've mentioned a few times now, writes in his book, The Naked Now, Learning to See as the Mystics See. Philippians chapter two, verses six to 11, is thought to be an early Christian hymn to the Christ journey a path of kenosis, incarnating a slave, 
as all humans are, and even all the way to the bottom of total acceptance, and even humbly yet, the cross. This allows God to raise Jesus up in God's time and in God's way, and to name him anew in a glorious state of transformation. He continues, This hymn can be taken as a rather precise guide for the process of contemplative prayer. If we apply to uh, the soul the same mystery that was in Christ Jesus, as mentioned throughout the book, take it as a rule, everything that we say of Jesus, we can also say about the soul. This is exactly how he becomes the icon of transformation for us and why he says, follow me. Paul's use of the hymn calls the Philippians to a life of similar humility, emptying themselves of their self-centeredness, individualism and self-reliance taking on the personhood of Jesus Christ made available through the Holy Spirit. Rohr explains this in his book, The Way We Can Take On the Self-Emptying Nature of Christ Jesus. He says the time we spend in contemplative prayer is a way of emptying ourselves before God. It is a discipline of our spiritual lives that benefits our souls. It's important to keep in mind that the way faith communities lived under the uh, constant threat of violence from state and religious persecution, so to say that they struggled in their lives would be probably a gross understatement. So Paul wrote to the community in Philippi to encourage them in their struggles. He encouraged them to live with the mind of Christ, or in other words, to live with the attitude Jesus displayed in his life. Jesus provides the foremost example for living with this new mindset and it is for us to continually to discern how we do this together for the benefit of all. Jesus encourages us through scripture, prayer and the Holy Spirit to set aside our propensity for individualism and to humble ourselves so that we put others before us. We become the servant of all. By doing this together in community, we are able to define what it means to live a good life. This is a life lived in faith and the service to our fellow beings and a life in care of God's creation. Today we live in a world that is mostly diametrically opposed to the way Jesus and Paul teaches us to live. The example set by our civic leaders, especially our national leaders, is a poor one. And I wonder how many young people uh, will grow up adopting the attitudes of denial of truth, bullying and self-aggrandizement and self-promotion at almost any cost to society. We are a community of faith, followers of Jesus Christ, and we are called to step out of our, uh, step out of our morass and out, find our way uh, of living our lives shaped by the characteristics of what Richard Rohr calls the second half of life, where God is firmly at the center and we have to focus on caring for others before ourselves. This is a struggle for most people, but once aware of the goal, we try and live our lives as Christ calls us. Humility and obedience are the touchstones of life. I wanna conclude by reading to you this passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians from Eugene Peterson's interpretation of the Bible called The Message. The contemporary language that he uses often resonates with our modern life in a different way to our traditional texts. If you have got anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favour. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way from the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to to lend a leading hand, a helping hand. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what. Not at all. 
When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honoured him far beyond anyone or anything, ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Christ Jesus and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honour of God the Father. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've been doing from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I am separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God willing and working at what will give God the most pleasure. Amen. Let us recite together the Apostles' Creed, Lord's Prayer and Suffrages. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness, that your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the earth, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor <clears throat> be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such a blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. 
My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember before you the family and friends of Breonna Taylor, who grieve her death and wonder why justice for her life has not been adequately served. Comfort them in their anguish and frustration and walk with them as they continue to pursue changes in policing in Louisville. Care for all families of those killed in police shootings and bring them justice and bring our communities change so that these deaths may not be in vain. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, you have given all peoples on one common origin. It is your will that though you gather together as one family in yourself, fill the hearts of humankind with the fire of your love and with the desire to ensure justice for all. By sharing the good things you give us, may we secure an equality for all your brothers and sisters throughout the world. May there be an end to division, strife and war. May there be a dawning of a truly human society built on love and peace. And we ask this in your name. Amen. O Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they may not need me without succor. Leave me not to be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those, to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. Almighty God, to whom we must account for all our powers and privileges, Guide the people of the United States and of this community in the election of officials and representatives, that by faithful administration and wise laws, the rights of all may be protected and our nation be enabled to fulfill your purposes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer of general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may best for us, and grant us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power was working in us, can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church, and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>